Jason Waxman. Good morning. It's good to see 3,000 of my closest friends and, and family. Um, you know, it's, it's great to be back here again, and I'm glad Kushaga reminded me that it's been nine summits. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be a part of all of them, and, and Intel's commitment to the open compute community has really started from the beginning. I remember it's, it's uh, easy to sort of forget when you've been part of something for so long how much has really changed. But I remember the initial kickoff when we formed the organization and how we sat together thinking, would a community really rally around hardware that was designed for hyperscale? Was there really lessons to be learned that could be passed on to the community? Was the idea of open source hardware really even a thing? And I think thanks to you, and the milestones that have been reached at this summit, it's clearly the case is yes, it can be done, you've made it happen, and that $1 billion milestone just wouldn't have been possible without you. So thank you um, for a great job in bringing the community together. Our commitment at Intel not only started from the beginning and the founding of the organization, but we've made a number of contributions, over 20 over the past couple of years, and there are now 75 Intel contributed products that are part of the community. So getting to a billion dollar milestone in the community is, is one point, but what's gonna take it to the next level? And that's really the, the purpose of my talk today is to highlight some of the projects, the things that I think are, are important and how the next wave of OCP-led projects and also the open source community as a whole is gonna be required to take things to the next level. We believe that about 80% of all of the workloads by 2025 are going to be deployed in hyperscale data centers. And you shouldn't interpret that as meaning that only few data centers, but rather that data centers will require scale. And this is in many cases not just cloud service providers, but also comms service providers as well. Many of you from the telco or the comms service provider community are here today, and in fact actually happen to represent and be the largest part, the fastest growing part of our community. The key here is we want to make sure that we're delivering technology that can be deployed at scale to allow the network to be virtualized, to accelerate the growth of cloud computing. And also, one of the things we've been talking about at the board level is what does the role of open compute mean in the shift to AI, and how do we start laying a foundation of open standards to help facilitate that transition? So that's really sort of the underpinning. And I believe that open source and open projects and true community is what's required to accelerate the move to hyperscale. And this obviously means open compute is a foundation of many of the compute building blocks, but also open source software. And I'll come back and talk a little bit about some of the projects and contributions we've been making in the community to make sure that open compute hardware can be utilized by a broader community. And as an umbrella, one of the things Intel has been investing in is this concept of rack scale design, which we see is the fundamental building block to the next wave of open compute and hyperscale data centers. Let me talk a little bit about what it means when we talk about rack scale design. There are three key principles that we see the evolution of hardware moving forward. Now I show a rack here and some of my, my friends in the community would remind me that this isn't just about racks, it's actually about pod scale or data center scale. But we use the rack here as sort of an illustration, if you will. One of the key principles is the ability to optimize for hyperscale. We grew up in a world, those of us that have been in the data center world for a while, where the two socket server was the standard industry building block. We now have increasing levels of complexity. We've got non-volatile memory, silicon photonics, accelerators, GPGPUs, all of this technology coming together. And to really make it consumable by the community, we have to take a scale for design type of approach and optimize for those workloads. The second principle of rack scale design is about resource pooling. If you have an infrastructure as a service or you have an application at scale, it can be much more efficiently utilized. It can more efficiently utilize the infrastructure if you do resource pooling. And then the third piece of rack scale design, and we've heard this term thrown out many, many times during the course of the day already, is disaggregation. And the ability to have pools of compute, pools of accelerators, pools of memory, pools of storage, et cetera, 
that can allow for late binding or independent refresh, and allowing both the software to kind of do its job while the underlying hardware can be provisioned efficiently. So these are some of the principles that we want to drive forward. And in order to do that, we've been enabling the industry with open standards-based APIs. And those of you that have been deploying RackScale design APIs know that the versions 2.3 will be available into the industry this year to support not just um, uh, storage pooling, but also FPGA pooling. We're working as we move into 2019 to make enhancements into the standards bodies, not just supporting Redfish, but also Swordfish, which would, which would combine with the SNEA efforts there. And then as we move to a world of more intelligent networks, how do we drive standards basis around that as well? So we'll continue to drive these APIs as a way of allowing applications to harvest the underlying resource pools in the infrastructure. So what I want to do now is walk through some of the building blocks that will comprise rack scale design. And obviously, you've got compute, network, and storage, but I'll also talk about the fundamentals, which are really critical, and we've heard speakers like Kashaga talk about earlier today, the importance of security, the importance of management as well. So to start off with, one of the things that we've done is not just enhance the existing designs in both the Mount Olympus form factor and the Tioga pass form factor with our latest generation Intel Xeon scalable processor. So continuing the roadmap of innovation from vendors such as WeWin and, and Quanta that have offered these platforms to the industry, but also making sure that these platforms are more modular. So what we want to be able to do is use these as fundamental building blocks that can address a range of different designs. Let me give an example and kind of walk you through a few different things. So at the bottom, you've got the open rack, which is the Tioga Pass uh, uh, platform that's been designed. This is a, uh, a third wide chassis. So it fits into a 2U, but you can go ahead and put three of those uh, into the chassis for those of you that are familiar with the design. What we've made sure is not only can you deploy it for uh, memcached or high compute performance applications, again, using the latest generation Xeon processors, but also to make sure that it's an effective storage platform as well. And what you see here is what we call the AVA board. It's a, a riser that allows you to go ahead and put um, up to six uh, uh, um, M2s onto the, the platform as a whole. Um, oops, sorry, I actually got the wrong one. Here we go. This is the Ava Rise card. It's actually got four of the M2s that fit into the slots. You could put two of these into the Tioga Pass platform, and that allows you not only to have an effective compute board, but to be able to extend it to 48 terabytes of, of fast flash storage. And then on the top, we have the Yosemite chassis, and the Yosemite chassis is actually a quarter uh, wide, but actually allows you to put um, in a 4U four of those different chassis. And there's two different types of configurations that you can support. Um, one is what we call Twin Lakes. And so Twin Lakes, you can see here, this is using the latest um, Intel uh, Xeon D. It's an SOC. And so you can put these four of these into a Yosemite chassis, and that allows you to get higher and more dense compute, so 72 cores into a 1U. Or, conversely, you can go ahead and put the um, Glacier Point chassis into it. So you can see how we're reusing the infrastructure to allow different types of configurability. If you need something that's optimized for a web tier or something that could be optimized for a storage tier, reusing the infrastructure is going to be continuously important. So compute is one aspect, but one of the big challenges has been optimizing for the network as a whole. And I wanted to talk about two aspects of it, one being on the, the connectivity. Now, last year, we announced that we were planning to introduce products at 100 gig CWDM4, and we've done that compliant with the OCP spec. But as the industry is moving to 12.8 terabit per second switches, and trying to drive lengths of two kilometers or 10 kilometers, this is becoming an increasing challenge. And I don't want to steal Andy's thunder. He's going to talk, I think, in more detail about the challenge around silicon photonics in just a bit. But integration and the supply chain and the ability to integrate optics with silicon and packaging and system form factors is a continual challenge. 
we want to take a leadership role here again along with the community by introducing 400 gig CWDM8 as the first introduction into the market for 400 gig optics. We believe that this is going to provide a cost-effective, manufacturable solution that will provide the industry with real uh, a capability this year. We'd love to see more of you in the community join the MSA around this effort to help go provide uh, momentum behind the spec and advance where we're going. And we should be able to provide production samples in 2018. What you see here on the screen right now is the, uh, the first uh, module is up here on the stage, and you can see that uh, this is what we're planning to start sampling later on this year. And we believe that it has the right capability and manufacturability, the cost points to really make 400 gig feasible in the market this year. So speeds is one aspect to it. And with the MES cards that we've provided in the network around OCP 2.0, we've introduced 25 and, and 40 gig products to be able to support the platforms and chassis that are required. But we know that not only are higher speeds being driven, more bandwidth being required, but the network's getting more intelligent. We're seeing FPGAs being applied to the network to do network offload uh, capabilities such as, as a smart and, and intelligent routing. And that's going to require more capability for the next generation of NIC MES. So we're working with the community on the OCP 3.0 NIC. And we expect that the spec should be done either late this year or, or early next year in terms of that spec. And again, ask that the community work with us to really define what those requirements are, make sure that they're platform is ready as we move to a world of not just a high bandwidth network, but one that's also intelligent. So moving to storage, and this goes back to what I said earlier about the importance of modularity. There are many different applications for storage, and I think as a community, the more that we can standardize on different types of building blocks, the more effective it's going to be able to deploy. And so in certain cases, you may want to have direct attached storage. You may want platforms that drive a high level of density and such as the Yosemite and Twin Lakes type of platform, or you may need a high degree of compute with direct attached storage, which would be applicable to the Tioga Pass platform. Or in some cases, you just need a, a, a JBOF, a disaggregated tier of flash, which would apply into the Lightning platform. But our goal in each of these cases is to be able to have fundamental building blocks that are efficient, that we work with the software community to have effective storage management. And that today, we also find ways to make sure that the underlying ingredients that go into these platforms are as high performance and as efficient as possible. And so what I'm pleased to kind of share with you and announce today is that we are bringing the Intel Optane SSDs, which are the, the most uh, flexible and, and high performance SSDs in the market, to the M.2 form factor. So whether you're looking at the high density platform and the glacier point carrier in the Yosemite platform, whether it's the high performance and the scalable uh, capability of the Tioga Pass platform, or even the ingredients where you'd want to drive more density into a, a lightning platform that we're bringing Optane SSDs at a higher capacity and a high performance into that form factor. As uh, Kishagra mentioned earlier today, one of the aspects of storage that's important is not just the capacity, the performance of the media, but there's been this constant push-pull between software and the underlying hardware. And we're really pleased to be supporting the Denali project. Uh, we think this is a great compromise between the industry, allowing the hardware vendors to do an effective job of managing the media and optimizing their driver and making sure that we can stand behind the right life and the performance of the drive while giving more control to the software that it needs, reducing the overhead of the, the hypervisor and virtual machines. And our job not only is to work with the community to help optimize that overall spec, but we want to make sure that as we combine Optane memory and also uh, FG3D NAND that we're able to go ahead and provide cost effective, high performance, and a range of different drives that can be applied into this project. So shifting a little bit away from the hardware, I wanted to say that, that we've heard you in the community that management is becoming increasingly important. 
and there's a strong desire for more open source software. And that's one of the other reasons that we've been pleased to take a leading role in the OpenBMC project. Now, we, along with many hardware providers in the industry, have been working on Redfish within the DMTF umbrella. But the ask from the community was help us with an open source BMC to be able to go make sure that the profiles that are available, for example, in Redfish could be easily applied into a BMC. And so we've open sourced and continue to work on open source profiles for the open BMC project to allow Redfish uh, profiles to be applied in the community. We think this will give greater transparency to the code base and allow more innovation from those of you in the community. Um, so we welcome your feedback on other capabilities that you'd like to go see in this project, but the source is out there on GitHub, and we encourage you to get involved and join the community around OpenBMC. One of the things that has been a huge reminder of the importance of the community is security. Um, we, I think many of you are, are aware of our response to Spectre and Meltdown, which was brought to us by the community. And I can tell you that at least the Intel actions that we've recently been able to confirm that we have microcode, microcode patches released for all of the processors that require mitigation over the last five years. And on top of it, we now have additional hardware fixes that are intercepting our next generation of both Xeon as well as core silicon. But that really was just the start. And I have to tell you and thank all of you in the community for your response and your support and your collaboration. Because not only bringing and helping us identify these vulnerabilities is important, but it's also critical that when we try and work on those mitigations that we understand the impact in the community. So I want to thank all of you that have helped us to continue to make sure that we are reminding ourselves that all of this infrastructure is great, but without a security first mindset, it's not going to mean a lot. And that's also one of the reasons why we're very pleased to be working with the community here around Project Cerberus. I believe that having a secure root of trust is important. I like the way that the community is implementing it from the standpoint of saying, hey, we need to have an overall API and allow some flexibility in the implementation. But ultimately, it's going to bring all of us in the community together, whether it's at the system level or all of the different components, CPUs, FPGAs, NICs, anybody that's providing firmware to help make sure that together we're providing a more secure platform. Moving up the stack even further, so let's assume now we have this, this great rack scale architecture, leading compute, flexible implementations, high performance networking, both on the MES and the NIC side of things, as well as connected to, uh, to, to and aggregated by silicon photonics. All of this infrastructure highly managed and secure. We still have to look at how can applications effectively utilize that infrastructure. And that's why we've been investing in a number of key software projects. And I wanted to bring a few of them to your attention. And I think one of the areas that we continue to talk about within the OCP board is the blurring of the lines between where does OCP start and stop from a hardware perspective, and where do other parts of the community begin from a software perspective. And I hope you'll, you'll engage us in that debate and provide feedback about what you'd like OCP to do and to collaborate across the industry. Now, with regard to OpenStack, we've had a number of different investments that we've made, but one of the things that I wanted to bring uh, to your attention is the importance of, of the network. We've heard from many of you, again, that are comms and telco service providers, that service chaining is going to be a requirement to truly operate in a cloud environment. And so we've made a number of different uh, contributions, investments, and resources to help support that capability within OpenStack. And then relating it to the Kubernetes community, we also implemented multi-network support, which is going to be critical to enabling uh, um, network function virtualization in a, a, a containerized environment. And so bringing those together for the network is one area of investment. The other really is about bringing more awareness for the hardware into the scheduling, into the orchestration layers of the platform. So we've been driving projects such as enhanced platform awareness in the OpenStack community. And we wanted to also make the application space more broad. So for example, we implemented large and giant page sizes within Kubernetes. So we're going to continue to invest 
in open source software, particularly to allow the community to make sure they've got high efficient infrastructure based on open compute, but you can efficiently deploy and schedule workloads based on things such as OpenStack and Kubernetes. So I want to, before I leave you, I want to point you to where you can go for more information. There's a lot of places where Intel's looking to support you in the community. If you'd like to learn more about rack scale design, please come see our booth where you can see some of the infrastructure, the APIs, the manageability standards, all there and get some of your questions answered and, and how you can contribute to that community. If you want to learn more about some of our management infrastructure, please see Mohan Kumar's session tomorrow. We'll be talking about the network, both in terms of the smart NIC and the direction there, but also what it means for silicon photonics. And Yuri Cummings has a session on that uh, as well. There'll be a session on democratizing AI, and this is where we can really, as a community, start to have the conversation about what standards mean in a world of AI. And then last is talking about where we're going and some of the new announcements around Optane memory, the M2 form factor, and some of the other storage class memory uh, advancements that we're delivering to the industry. I can't thank you enough for everything that you do here. I'm looking forward to working with you on the next billion dollars that we bring to the community. Thank you.